Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. FedEx's Richard Smith on Memphis, economic development, and much more tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Richard Smith, who is carries multiple roles at the chamber, uh, not the chamber, and at uh, FedEx. You are regional president U.S. of FedEx Express. You're executive vice president of global support for FedEx Express. And you are the outgoing ch uh, president of the Memphis Chamber. So thank you for being here. Thank you. We'll thank talk you. Appreciate about you having me. A little bit of all that today, along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. So let's start with a kind of big picture, and this is both a, a, a question for you as a, as a resident, as somebody who's been very involved in the chamber as president for the last two years at a very difficult time for the chamber after the loss of Phil Trenary, but also you know, heavily involved in FedEx. When you think about Memphis's biggest challenges from a business point of view, what, what, what comes to mind? Well, I, the, the biggest challenge I think that uh, Memphis f faces is our poverty. Uh, level and um, equity is another big challenge. There was a statistic that came out, uh, I think it was a 2015 census report that came out and said essentially less than 1% of all business receipts accrue to uh, black owned businesses. And in a community that is 64% minority, that's simply unsustainable. So the problem that I set out to solve when I became chairman uh, of the Greater Memphis Chamber was interrelated to that issue. So Carolyn Hardy, who preceded me as the chamber chair, had kicked off a large MWBE supplier diversity initiative uh, as part of our chairman circle, one of the moon missions of the chairman circle, if you will. We asked all of our um, chamber members to try to do at least one new contract with an MWBE business. We followed up with them. We exceeded the goal that we that we set, uh, though it was a pretty low goal to be quite uh, candid. Um, the, the challenge though was the lack of real economic growth in our community. So when you have a, a pie that's not growing and you're literally going to your existing member company, some of whom have long standing relationships with their suppliers and vendors and you're saying, hey, I know you have a, a relationship with this company over here, we're asking you to switch and, and move it to somebody else. That is a difficult proposition. So. We didn't make as much progress on the supplier diversity initiative, the MWBE initiative, as we wanted to in that two years. And I kept pointing to the lack of top line growth as the real problem. Because if you're not growing at all, if your real GDP growth is essentially a dead man's EKG, as ours was for decades um, until more recently, your, your ability to solve that specific problem, the, your ability to have an impact on equity and poverty in this community is non-existent. So I had to get us growing. Right, and, and for, we'll come back to a lot of those issues um, and which, which you just brought up, but let's flip that question to say, what are our biggest advantages as a city? So, so I think uh, some of our biggest advantages that go, um, the ones that you, know, you always read about, certainly uh, geography, certainly the um, transportation and logistics infrastructure in terms of where we sit, having FedEx here, of course, is a big one. Um, but you know, we have all four uh, major modes of transport. You've got your river, fourth largest inland river port in the United States of America. Rail, all five class one railroads converge here. Great road connectivity, highway infrastructure and connectivity for surface transport on the road. And of course, runway or ramp, uh, which is, is air transport. We're the second largest air cargo hub in the world, second only to Hong Kong. Uh, and the largest certainly in North America. So you've got those inherent advantages, but I think something that really goes uh, unheralded is the um, diversity in our community and the people. Um, demographically, we're a young community. There are a lot of cities right now, particularly with uh, labor um, so tight and unemployment uh, hovering around historical lows, there are a lot of communities that would love to have the demographic makeup of the population that we have. We're a majority millennial city, meaning the majority, the largest demographic in our um, community is in that millennial bracket. 
Um, we have a lot of Gen Z folks entering the workforce now or attempting to enter the workforce. A lot of young people in this community. So I think that's something that companies, as they're looking around for uh, places to expand or to move or, or set up a location, they're looking for who has the workforce. So it's increasingly becoming a, an important issue, and that is an asset that we have is just our demographic makeup of our population. Let me bring Bill in. So where do you think we are at this point in growing minority business? And, and have we settled <coughs> what was the question about, about basically a carrot or, or stick approach to this? Yeah, I, so I, I think the, the carrot or the stick approach was um, essentially part of my push to figure out what were the obstacles to us growing. That was one of many, by the way. It, it, and, and what I think you're specifically referring to was a proposal that I had put on the table to look at um, a new type of incentive structure, what I called uh, the diversity uh, accelerator, which would have been the incentives deepen the more MW, as, as you spend more with MWBE suppliers and vendors. Um, I had basically said, look, no other community we compete with has this hard requirement out there for companies, particularly foreign capital coming into your market, that presents a risk that no one else presents to them. So it was a challenge. I said, why don't we incentivize it instead? There was a pretty um, vitriolic reaction to that from the community. Um, at that point in time, we hadn't won a headquarters or back office project since 2005 when IP, International Paper, consolidated their global headquarters here. So I would narrowly tailored it to say, why don't we just aim it at, at, uh, at, at that segment and remove the requirement and make it pure incentive. Well, it's probably a good thing I didn't do that because we began winning headquarters deals, including my own shortly thereafter. And I'm happy to report when it comes to the FedEx Logistics headquarters, we're at about 30% uh, MWBE participation, uh, which is excellent and higher than the, the norm on that project. But to, to go back to your question, um, <laughs> The, that was all an, an, an attempt to essentially remove something that I had been told by site selectors was a, was a barrier and saying, hey, let's, let's focus on winning the deals at the top line level and then incentivizing what we want is more MWBE, which is more MWBE spin. Um, so essentially after talking to a lot of um, minority business owners in the community, I said, well, fine, you don't have to remove the requirement, de-risk it. So what you need is you need someone to take ownership of that process and work with, particularly a foreign company, to connect them to the MWBE suppliers that are out there, similar to what Joanne Massey does for the city side. When you contract with the city, she's there to, um, to up that uh, MWBE spend and to actually be a resource to work with you as you're contracting with the city and help connect you with the, the, the suppliers that can do the work. So the suppliers and contractors are, from your point of view, and you mentioned FedEx Logistics moving down to the Gibson building downtown, they're out there. Because that was always, that was a part of the conversation of people saying, you know, behind closed doors or they on are, camera, they're, they're not there. We can't, they are and they enough. aren't. Okay. So we have capacity in certain areas. We have lots of capacity in some areas. We lack it in other areas. So that's part of when you're talking about this carrot versus stick thing, I, I don't think it's an either or actually. I think it's really about de-risking it for a company, having a resource there, whether it's housed at Edge, whether it's the Chamber. And the Chamber and Edge, and as part of our regional economic alliance, is very focused on this and working with companies and helping to try to connect them with the minority and women-owned uh, suppliers that can do the work. Mm -hmm. And what you find is in some areas we have capacity, lots of it. Uh, in some areas it's an issue of scale. So we may have capacity, but it's a uh, you know, small two-person outfit that couldn't do work at the scale of, say, a FedEx hub modernization project or a St. Jude expansion uh, unless you had a lot of small vendors come together and there's of course some focus on how do we do that? How do we build some scale by basically getting a lot of smaller minority and women owned vendors together who could actually meet the requirements for scale that a large scale project uh, has. So there are a number of things we're doing there to try to address those challenges. And then there's other areas where there's no capacity. And that's what our 800 initiative, which we kicked off with Epicenter, and which FedEx is a big sponsor of, and of course Epicenter, you know, was a chamber moon mission that spun out and now stands on its own two feet and has been wildly successful in helping entrepreneurs, particularly minority and women-owned uh, uh, small businesses or startups. And they're trying to build capacity in those areas where we identify a lack of capacity. So we're really trying to kind of complete the ecosystem, if you will, and say, how do we plug in the MWBE suppliers where we have capacity? 
how do we help them achieve scale where they don't have it today or maybe help them uh, pull together so they can have the scale to meet the needs of a larger project where today they couldn't on their own and then how do we fill in the gaps in the capacity where we lack it today so we're trying to do all of the above to address that issue so so, so what you're trying to knit together here is essentially something that can hold together and continue to, to produce gains in the share of minority business even when the economy is not booming as it is today. 100%, and, and in terms of the economy not booming, well, if you're looking at the global economy, certainly not. I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, it's been well documented that that is a result of a lot of the um, trade policy here and abroad and protectionism in the world, which has slowed things down. In the U.S., um, obviously the industrial sector is, is slowing down, but the American consumer is still strong. But when you look at Memphis and Memphis's growth, we're actually growing faster than we have in decades. Now that's because our real GDP growth was so low that the bar was down here, but it's still a trend moving in the right direction. So I would say we should celebrate that success. I mean, we are growing right now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even in an economic downturn where things get uh, soft, I'm not sure uh, that that would hurt Memphis this time as badly as, as the last recession did because we have some momentum going into it and because the cost of living here and some of the other advantages we have in terms of being a very fiscally well-run state um, would benefit us. So there may be companies that in an economic downturn in the U.S. should the consumer sentiment start to slow and, and we dip into a, a recession. I'm going to use the R word that everybody hates. Did you just predict hates. a recession? I, don't I didn't think predict you... it. I'm just saying if and when it happens, I think we're in a better position now, particularly relative to peer cities we compete with, for all those reasons. I mean, our cost of living is lower. We could actually see uh, continued growth going into a, 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 an economic downturn or a, a U.S. recession for that reason, and, and largely because we've established some momentum. Mm -hmm. Because of what's in the pipeline? Because of what's in the pipeline. I mean, we're, we're, we're actually growing our population after years and years of out-migration and decline. We're actually seeing some of the healthiest growth we've seen in about 15 years. Uh, I think, uh, and I've got some stats here if you'll mm -hmm. forgive me, but um, it, 2018 marked the metro area's fastest year of population growth in five years, which was up 0.22%. Our population was up to 0.22% from 2017. So that's an encouraging sign. People aren't moving out to the degree they were. We're actually making up ground and, and net net, we're, we're growing as a population for the first time in many, many years. Uh, Moody's Analytics currently forecasts our population growth in 2020 will exceed the national average for the first time since 2006. So we're headed in the right direction. We do have momentum. Is it as fast as everybody wants? Is it solving all of the problems of our community? No, but you had to get growing before you could really address anything, as I pointed out in the beginning. When you, what, one of those, you talked about moving and in migration. You did move, you're moving FedEx Logistics, which are you were CEO of FedEx Logistics? I was trade, the, uh, trade Networks, is that right? It was Trade Networks. <laughs> okay. uh, we combined it with FedEx Supply Chain, which was okay. another smaller uh, operating company. It was a company called Genco we acquired, and we put them together, and that became the newly rebranded FedEx Logistics. Okay. That, that decision to move to downtown, um, you know, I think most people like that if you like downtowns or if you're a believer in the importance of downtown, so it felt good civically. But was it, what was the business decision what is, what remains, because the move hasn't happened yet. What, what is the business decision behind moving downtown? So the business decision was a, it was a very sound one for us, but a lot of things had to happen to make it a fiscally sound uh, decision. A lot went into this. So as we consolidate these companies, right, as we basically take uh, FedEx Trade Networks, which had legacy headquarters operations in uh, other cities, in, in Buffalo, we had Custom Critical, which was a part of that, which will actually come into the Express segment, but had uh, headquarters operations in Akron. Uh, we had headquarters operations in Tampa, and Supply Chain had them up in Pittsburgh. We basically said to make this one you know, FedEx operating company, we were going to make it a fourth FedEx core operating company, we needed to have a global headquarters. And if you look at the, the trend in terms of attracting new talent, particularly millennial and Gen Z, they want to be in live, urban live, work, and play environments in an urban core. Uh, recently it was announced that, or right before I started looking into this actually, it was announced that um, Ford Motor Company was moving back into downtown Detroit. And so I'd seen such trends 
with other corporations looking to take the mountain to Muhammad, so to speak, in terms of going to where the future talent is that you want to attract. And I said, okay, if we're going to pull this together and we're going to be able to attract the talent we need in consolidating these legacy headquarters functions in Memphis, Tennessee, it needs to be downtown. I loved the idea of the Gibson Guitar Factory. I talked to Nick Vardy at Service Master about the, the industrial reclamation project uh, that became their headquarters, which was the old Peabody Place Mall. He said it had been very successful for them. The employees uh, loved it. Obviously, there was a little bit of noise from people whose commute got lengthened, but for the most part, he said it had been great for the employees and building a sense of community down there, attracting uh, new employees. So I knew strategically it was where I wanted to go. Your challenge comes in when you take a, a facility like that, which is an old factory, a guitar factory, which really has no other use <laughs> sitting right across from the FedEx Forum, and to convert that into Class A office space, you're talking about significant capital. Um, you're talking probably about 45 million or so um, was what I believe we projected to retrofit that into Class A office space. And that decision came at a very tough time for us right when this global economic slowdown because of the trade dispute really started to hit and we were taking some other actions across other FedEx segments um, to reduce costs. So it was a very difficult sell internally at FedEx and we had to make the numbers work. In fact, I could not make them work initially, which is why we walked away from it. And then, of course, we were able to get the deal done. The state came through with more and in incentives, <coughs> headquarters credits and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing where, like, you know, in the, I don't know, you know, you'll get credit, critics, there's always a critic of sure. anything that happens. But, you know, this gets into incentives and incentives, obviously the chamber and you, you've, you've been involved in the, the um, with Edge and all, it's always a big issue, right? And people look from the outside and some say, look, you know, FedEx is a multi-billion dollar company. They don't need incentives. Why in the world would they get any kind of incentive? They've got plenty of money. What is your response to those people? You, you have to ask yourself in that particular instance, do you want me moving my headquarters downtown and keeping 350 high wage jobs here that are already in Memphis and then bringing hundreds of additional jobs, another about 350 net new in that building? And then, of course, there's a phase two, two to that, which will bring even more jobs to the Memphis area. In fact, more than we can even fit in the Gibson. So do you want all of that, all those jobs coming down there, or would you rather have your vacant guitar factory uh, falling into disrepair across from your NBA arena? That's the only choice you get. <laughs> right. And, and how much pressure do you have? I mean, you know, I don't know if it's analysts, if it's, it's shareholders saying, wait, is this, why are you guys doing this? Why can't sure. you just get it, cheap it, office space it, out in the suburbs? I mean, do you get that's your exactly public company? That's exactly the conversation so, we yeah. had. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the conversation we had, which is, if I can't make it a financially good decision for the company and offset the, the capex that's got to go into that facility, then I would have done something cheaper in the suburbs or I would have shopped it around. I mean, we could have gone to one of those other cities I mentioned. We didn't have to be in Memphis. Right. We could have gone to Pittsburgh. We could have gone to Akron. Right. So, and then, and then <clears throat> before I go back to Bill, the other thing, and this plays into the whole debate about incentives, that is cities are competing against each other. And I think that's a thing that I've heard you make this case before and I've heard other people on the show make the case that it isn't just Memphis versus, you know, downtown versus suburbs. It is Memphis versus Indianapolis versus Pittsburgh versus Absolutely. other places. 100%. So you all are in many, many cities, right? Various parts of FedEx. Are there, are there cities where you just don't get, where one, a company of your scale just doesn't get incentives off the cuff? Not any cities that we have any uh, operations of any size in that I can think of. I mean, everybody's, everybody plays this game in some form or another, but I think we have a tendency, and a lot of communities have a tendency to look at it the wrong way, right? So go back to my headquarters example. If I can't justify that as a good, sound financial decision, as much as I might like the idea and think we're skating to where the puck is going in terms of attracting talent, if it's a bad business decision, our CFO at FedEx Corp isn't going to go for it. Our shareholders and investors aren't going to like it. The analysts are going to scrutinize it. And it's, it's not a good decision for the long-term health of the business if I can't make it work financially. So when you look at that, we have a tendency as a community to focus on the, the tax break or the tax revenue that's quote unquote being given away. But remember what I just told you, if I can't justify it financially, I'm not doing it. And in that case, it would have never happened. So you're, you're, you're worried about tax revenue in that instance because it's, it's almost all tax breaks and incentives related to the pilot or state headquarters credits that you only get that tax break if the jobs materialize. Um, 
if you, you can't give away what you don't have. I mean, it's like this is like crying over spilled milk when there was never milk in the glass to begin with. I mean, that, that deal was not going to happen. In fact, like I said, we walked away from it because I just couldn't make it work. It was bad timing for us. The financials weren't there to offset the capital. And then the state came back and, and we worked with the Downtown Memphis Commission and others to make that happen. And you look at the, the, the multiplier effect that's going to be generated from that for, down, for downtown businesses, all the economic activity, the headquarters itself spurs. When we move in to that building, all the high wage jobs that are coming down there, the people that are spending money, and then look at the, the additional benefit and the effect that it's had on downtown. I'm not going to say that move in and of itself was responsible for all this growth downtown. I mean, there's a lot of things that went into that. St. Jude's expansion, Indigo Ag coming down there. Service um, Master, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Service Master, all this other stuff that went into it. But having a you know, Fortune 100 company set up shop in your downtown and say, I'm going to put a headquarters here, certainly doesn't hurt when it yeah. comes to accelerating the momentum. So you get all that goodness. And if, you know, without the, the tax break, so to speak, none of that happens. So you just, the only question you have to ask yourself in these deals, and they're not all winners. We know that from, from some of the ones we've had in the past. Electrolux is the one everybody, everybody points to. They're not all winners, so you have to scrutinize these deals. But the only question you have to ask yourself is, am I better with this deal or without it? And you have to look at the whole thing. And, and you, you can't assume I'm giving away too much tax revenue when a company sitting there telling you, I'm not going to do this deal if I can't make it work right. financially. Uh, Bill, with four minutes left. Yeah. Um, th th there's this rival you may have heard of between Memphis and Nashville, and, and we look at what I think everybody would describe as explosive growth in, in Nashville. Is too much growth something to be, to be wary of? Or, or is any, any growth under any conditions ideal for a city? Well, certainly too much growth is something to be wary of, but let's, be, let's get real here. I just pointed to our population growth, which was 0.22% the right way, as opposed to going the wrong way as it has been for decades. I mean, we're, we're, like, a, we're like a team that's, that's scored a, a few touchdowns early in the game. Uh, we don't need to drop into prevent defense here and, and try to ride out the rest of the ballgame. We're a long way from Nashville's mm -hmm. growth, so I think for us to start worrying that we're growing too fast is a little premature. Having said that, the good thing about growing more slowly is you can plan for it, right? And you can start having those community conversations about pilots and incentives. Are we giving away too much in tax revenue? Now that we've got some momentum, well, may, maybe we should dial it back. But again, you have to look at each deal on the merits and say, Am I better with this deal or without it? Um, to sit there and walk in and assume that the, the business owner is bluffing, you know, to assume that AutoZone, if they don't get this pilot, is going to expand anyway, well, you know, that, that, can, that can have bad consequences uh, for you if, 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 you, um, if you try to bluff these, these companies. In my case, you, wouldn't have, you would have had an empty guitar factory sitting there across from the FedEx Forum, which I don't think would have been good for downtown Memphis at all, certainly not that end of downtown. Mm -hmm. We talked about the highway jobs associated with the, you know, the office jobs and more the tech jobs, but the other side of, of uh, Memphis economy, very much the distribution uh, infrastructure, not, and I'm not picking on FedEx here, the mm -hmm. whole infrastructure. Some critics of incentives or critics of our, our sort of um, economic plan, as it were, right now is that we're too dependent on those sort of low skill, low wage jobs. W where do you see one us being too, as a, as a economy, too dependent on those jobs? Oh, I think we absolutely are, uh, in some respects, too dependent on them. Um, but the good news is, I guess for better or worse, that I don't know that we're going to be too dependent on them for long because you can't find folks that want to do them. I mean, on any given night uh, at the FedEx hub, we're short 1,000 to 1,200 employees out there on any given night. And uh, in terms of pilots and things of that nature, well, there's a minimum wage uh, threshold of $13. They have to pay at least $13 per hour to even qualify for a pilot. And um, I can tell you a lot of companies around here, including us, start higher than that, and we cannot find the employees. So. Are we too, have we historically been too dependent on those jobs? Yes, uh, I think we have. Will we continue to be uh, so dependent on them? I think maybe less and less so simply because 
you, you're finding less people who are willing to come in and do the work, even as the wages rise. Does that then get into, we could talk for 25 minutes about this, but with a minute or so left, automation and automation in, you know, FedEx Hub and in other distribution facilities, is that part, part of what drives automation? Oh, for sure. I mean, automation is, is coming because it has to. So in the, in, in the trucking segment, for example, um, there are a lot of companies looking at autonomous or what they call platooning, where you have one uh, tractor trailer driven by a person and then one that platoons behind it where you've got more than one load uh, moving on the same lane because they can't find the drivers. Uh, at the hub, I just mentioned, 1,000 to 1,200 employees short on any given night. So the automation we're putting into the hub, it actually won't reduce staffing levels from materially from where they are now. What it will do is allow us to process more volume without having to add more heads because we already can't find the people to come, come perform those, those jobs. And do you, do you see, I mean, do you see reductions in labor over, if you look 10 years out? This is, a, again, a big question. Sure. I mean, does automation get into the existing workforce at some point? I think, I think it, it, it does, but it normalizes over time because if you look historically, any time there is some sort of new technology that comes along, whether it's the cotton gin or the you know tractor and the agricultural segment, there's always workers that are displaced in the short term. But historically, other than periods like the Great Depression, we've always hovered around five to ten percent unemployment. So there's new work that comes All right. along. All right, we're going to extend this. We're going to have audio a little bit, 10, 15 more minutes with sure. Richard. It'll be on the Daily Memphian website. Thank you for joining us right now. That will go up very soon. Thank you. Good night.